Hey guys, the Firebird is here. It's just me. My lazy couch potato of a brother couldn't be here today because he's helping Loader give away bikes. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless you watch the Loader video, which you can right now. I uploaded that about a couple of weeks ago. It's really good, really interesting. I really recommend it. But anyways, you guys are not here for that. So I'm back to doing movie content after what? Recording three Transformers Air Rise videos in a row, which I might add, put a lot of effort into those, so please go check them out. <laughs> I know you guys like my movie content, but I also do non-movie content. So it's been a while since I did the Transformers Dark of the Moon cut content video, where I basically looked at the Transformers Dark of the Moon comic adaptation and looked at some other things that the comic did differently. I do plan on doing a part two to the Dark of the Moon cut content for some producer statements on stuff that happens in the novel and a few other toys that didn't make the cut into the actual film. But for the time being, I'm revisiting this, you know, little series, this little mini series with Revenge of the Fallen. I'm gonna be looking at the Revenge of the Fallen comic and look at what the comic did differently. And I think you guys will enjoy this because I feel like between Dark of the Moon and Revenge of the Fallen, Revenge of the Fallen had more um, cut content slash major differences from the actual film. So without further ado, we're gonna take a look right about now. So the comic starts pretty much like the movie does with you know the fallen and prehistoric earth and then we cut to shanghai china in the year 2009 now one major change is that the militia instead of being on his road mode when he's fighting the humans he's actually causing some mayhem in his vehicle mode his construction vehicle mode and i have to say i sort of prefer the comic version because imagine how cool would it be if we actually got to see the decepticons cause some mayhem in their vehicle modes and then just transition to the robot modes before everything turns more chaotic that would have been really cool to see. So anyways, so the Nest forces are being overwhelmed and then Militia starts making his getaway in his vehicle mode, I might add. So much like in the movie, Ironhide is sent out to take out the Militia and Sideways is being chased by the twins who screw up immediately and let Sideways get away. And the whole chase scene with Sideways plays pretty much like it does in the movie. But then we cut to the Militia who, unlike in the movie where the Militia was like going through, you know, a bridge filled with innocent civilians and just tossing a few cars here and there. It looks like the Autobots and Ness have done a much better job at evacuating the city because there's no clear civilians on site. Now unlike in the movie where it was Optimus Prime and Ironhide who did this, it looks like Ironhide alone managed to knock the militia out of the bridge. And as the militia falls, Optimus Prime just straight up from the airplane falls to the ground, transforms using his energon blade and lands on top of the militia, like just like BAM killing him. That's awesome. I really like this so far. So much like in the movie, Sideswap gets the final blow on sideways. But unlike in the movie where he got cut in half, Sideswipe seems to um punch him with his sword. It's kind of weird, but an interesting change is that unlike in the movie where it was Demolisher who gave the warning about the falling to the Autobots and the humans, this time around in the comic, it's Sideways who does that. This is not your planet to rule. The Fallen shall rise again. That's your one and only Sideways cameo for this video. Hope you guys are happy with that. We then cut to Sam and something that I feel like it's really interesting and I wish they would have added this in the movie because this solves a major... um gripe I have with the first Transformers movie is that the Autobots and Decepticons basically, you know, let themselves be seen in the Battle of Mission City. Like, there's plenty of people who see them, plenty of civilians, so the fact that, like, they don't acknowledge, like, how they managed to cover up the whole thing or, like, what did they say to hide the existence of the Autobots and Decepticons or justify what happened, it appears that they place responsibility of the carnage from Mission City squarely on McLaren Robotics. Basically, what they're saying is that the robots were in fact in there but they were a government project that just happened to win loose because of like a bad GPS tracking error and malfunctions happening. So the public knows that there's robots. They know that they exist but they don't know that they're aliens and they don't know that they're sentient. So yeah we get plenty of like Sam and Michaela scenes, the, the old spark falls and we got the kitchen bots making their appearance. And I also really like how the comic cut the one 
kitchen bar that has that really inappropriate design. I thought that was also interesting. The rest of the scene plays up pretty much like it does in the movie, with some very minor differences. We then cut to the nest space. Much like in the actual movie, director Galloway shows up, and like he accuses the Autobots for them being the reason why the Decepticons haven't left the planet. And we get some human Autobot bickering, much like we do in the movie, with Samway also listening in on the conversation. We then cut back to Sam in college, which again, it's pretty boring, we're gonna skip. The scene where Ravage infiltrates the nest base is pretty much the same, except that they tone down the violence and we don't see nest soldiers be literally cut in half by red men, which that's kind of a letdown. When Sam's at the party and he's being hit by that one Decepticon pretender, instead of her getting into the car and like having that whole awkward scene with Sam about, you know, teenage romance or whatever, Sam just leaves her in the party and just goes outside and meets with Bumblebee, who says that Optimus Prime is there to see him. So they drive to the same cemetery that they do in the movie and Optimus Prime texts Sam how they need his help to remind the humans that they're allies and that they're there to help them. This scene happens at night and happens immediately after Sam leaves the party party in Revenge of the Fallen. And unlike in the movie, I like how it's handled here because Optimus Prime tells Sam that the Decepticons have stolen the Allspark, meaning that Optimus Prime knows that they are gonna use it to revive Megatron, so he knows ahead of time that that's coming. Something that I might add is that the twins and Bumblebee are also present during the whole conversation. But I really do like how it's handled in the comics, like, he actually does give a couple of reasons that showing that things are, you know, ramping up, that these Opticons are on the move, they stole the Allspark, Megatron's gonna come back, and the humans are losing faith on the Autobots. It's a much more compelling argument, and more pressure on Sam to join them and help them, unlike Kai was done in the movie. And also, before we go on, I wanna mention that there seems to be an underlying theme going through these comic chapters. And that theme is like faith in other people and in each other. You guys are gonna see more of that as we go along, but Optimus Prime is like basically telling Sam to have more faith in himself. Because Sam seems to think that his help is worth nothing basically, that he has nothing to contribute to the Autobot. And he says that they're on their own. Not because he hates them or anything, but just because, well, he just doesn't believe in himself. And it's things like this that make me believe that the comic is so much better than the movie because if you look at the movie by itself, I don't think there was an underlying theme except uh, fight, hot girls, robots, and um, explosions. But in here, there's a genuine theme going on about faith and trust in each other. Another addition that the comic does that I think it's really cool and I wish we saw this in the movie is that when Megatron is revived and leaps out the water, he says, and now, let there be terrible retribution and carnage unbound. Megatron is reborn. It's a small little piece of dialogue from Megatron, but I think it's kind of badass and I'm really upset that we never got to see this in the movie. Like, as soon as Megatron destroys the submarine, it'd be really cool if he said that, like, as he say, Megatron is reborn and his first act is kill a bunch of humans. That would have been really cool. I feel like the dialogue that Megatron has with Starscream as he's heading towards the Nemesis is also incredibly cool. Starscream is like, Megatron, is, is that really you? Back from the dead, Starscream, your worst nightmare resurrected. Tremble at dread at my second coming. That's, that's awesome. Why did Michael Bay not keep the movie is beyond me. Oh, and also, Megatron is a triple changer in the comics. Yes, you heard that right. And no, I don't mean like in the movie where he transformed into a tank and the tank could fly and then he has a robot mode. In the comics, Megatron has his robot mode, his jet mode from the first movie, his tank mode, and the tank can still fly. If you wanna count the flying tank, he's a quadruple changer. Not sure how that works, but it does. I also, I really love this one panel of like Megatron, like, <laughs> like slapping Starscream with his tiny arm. It's... It's hilarious, someone should meme that, please meme it. So he meets up with the Fallen, the Fallen tells him that Sam has absorbed the knowledge of the old spark and that they can use it to like find the harvester and stuff. And we get that one scene when Sam basically writes a bunch of Sabatron and gibberish. So the rest of the scenes happen pretty much the same as they do in the movie. Sam gets ridiculed, he contacts Michaela, Michaela finds Wheelie, with the only exception being that this time Wheelie doesn't get one of his eyes blown away. Now we cut to the moment that you guys have been waiting for, the forest fight. So before the forest fight begins, the Autobots actually give a reason as to why they split up. In the movie, it made no sense. Like, Optimus and Bumblebee showed up and the rest of the Autobots were like separated from them, which was really idiotic and made no sense. But this time, we get a scene where the Nest Forces explain that there are multiple Decepticon hotspots 
across the eastern United States and the Autobots have basically gone on ahead to engage them. Optimus Prime, while they're on the move, says that they're gonna split up into three teams. And I'm super glad that he says that because it gives us a justification for, you know, Optimus Prime and Bumblebee to be separated from the rest. Unlike in the movie where they kind of just were. So now we cut to the scene you all been waiting for. The time where Sam gets sort of um assaulted by Alice. Now something that the comic does and I think it's really cool is that we get Leo and his friends. Uh, he is Sam's roommate for those of you who didn't care about him. And they're watching a commercial and it's basically Alice in Wonderland. And then we have another panel which basically shows her in the same pose. So um Alice is taking on the human appearance of Alice in Wonderland which you know it's Interesting, I guess. I don't know. Oh, and this time there's no hentai tentacle um, tongue coming out from her. Yeah, and this time it just comes from the back of her head, which... Oh god, look at that. That's, that's nightmare fuel. Actually, just for you guys, I'm gonna let that image stay on screen for a couple of minutes and I'm not gonna say anything. Okay, now that I creeped you all out, I'm gonna creep you out again. Check this out. Yeah, I, I, I feel like the comic in some ways is like more creepy than the actual movie. Like at this point I kind of missed the hentai tongue tentacle thing. So everything here plays out much like it does in the actual movie with the humans escaping from Alice. But what's interesting is that in this scenario Alice doesn't die, like Michaela doesn't just ran her over. This time she kind of falls off the car and she's kind of just left alone. And much like in the movie they get captured by not blackout. So much like in the movie, the whole, you know, Sam eating Megatron scene plays out pretty much the same with the Doctor appearing. But in this version, the Doctor actually gets killed by Optimus Prime with a very precise shot which basically headshots him. And um, I'm really surprised that Prime managed to do that considering that his bullets are, you know, huge. It's pretty weird. So Optimus and Bonobi appear, they had their small fight. And here, we see Megatron triple change into his jet mode, unlike what it was done in the movie. Unlike in the movie where there was a small chase scene where the Autobots were trying to get away from the abandoned facility that the Decepticons were holding Sam and the humans in, this time the fight happens like right outside the building. The building kind of just explodes and um, Optimus and Sam fall off a cliff into a forest and Optimus Prime and Megatron proceed to have their fight. And this time, the all of us are a bit quicker to respond. Ironhide is leading the charge, and even the RC sisters are there, unlike in the movie where they just went missing. So, Optimus Prime single-handedly fights Starscream and Grindor. Now, you guys are probably expecting a really, really epic fight scene like it happened in the movie. The famous forest fight is one of a lot of the Transformers movie fans' favorite fight scene of all the Transformers movies. But, I have sad news for you, it's really short in the comic and Grindor dies in the most stupid way possible. Optimus Prime punches Starscream and Starscream basically stumbles onto Grindor and Grindor dies. I am not even kidding, that's how he dies. So Starscream gets punched by Optimus and Grindor just dies from having Starscream be pushed into him. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined. As soon as Grindor dies, Megatron immediately takes the chance to kill off Optimus while he's basically off guard. Unlike how it was done in the movie where Optimus Prime had that small respite after he killed Grindor and was looking for Sam. Like Megatron like, just experts no expense, as soon as Grindor dies, he just stabs Optimus in the chest. Now unlike in the movie where the Autobots appear just as Sam's about to get captured by the Decepticons, the Autobots appear as soon as Optimus Prime gets stabbed. In this version they were a whole lot quicker but they still weren't quick enough. The Autobots manage to chase away the Decepticons and Ratchet gets close to Optimus Prime in an attempt to try and heal him but he merely states that he's nearly gone. We also get a small scene of Elite One actually like tending to Optimus Prime and like being concerned for him which it's something and it's more hint at the relationship unlike what we got in the actual movie where they didn't interact at all. Hey guys, so I was editing this video and you know what, I just underestimated how much cut content from Revenge of the Fallen there is. There's so much that we're not even halfway there. So for the sake of keeping this video short and making your lives and my lives easier, I'm gonna split this video into maybe three parts. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to edit 
what's left of the current footage into like less than 15 minutes because there's half an hour of footage that I still have yet to edit. So um, I'm gonna be cutting it here, we're gonna be ending part 1 with the forest fight and we're gonna be going into part 2 from the forest fight to the finale or like halfway through it. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to finish next episode, we'll just have to wait and see. So yeah. Can we get some F into chats for poor Blacka who got killed literally by someone tripping on him? Can you believe that? What a wimp. But anyways guys, before we go, shout out to our patrons, Morice Prime, Mateo, Mario Gordon, Christopher Prime, Stephanie Ballard, and the absolute madman himself, Jordan the Great, who donated $100. Thank you guys for donating, it's much appreciated, and if you guys want to donate to my Patreon, Links in the description down below and in the comments down below. By donating to my Patreon, you get access to some of my videos early. You can request your own videos. You receive a shout out at the end of my videos. You can participate in some of my videos if you so choose. And you get a few previews of some of my new works that are currently in development. There are plenty of rewards that you get as a result of becoming one of my patrons. And I do plan to adding a few more in the future as time goes on and the patrons grow. But keep in mind that donating is entirely optional. Because freedom is the right of all sentient beings. Thank you to my patrons for donating, it's much appreciated. And if you guys wanna donate, you know what to do. So, yeah, thanks a lot, guys. Anyways, guys, that's it for this video. Hopefully, you'll enjoy. I'm sorry, I wanted this to be like the Dark of the Moon episode in which I talk about all of the COD content. But Rebirth of the Fallen has so much. The comic is so different from the movie that there's just so much stuff to cover. And it is literally gonna take me two episodes, maybe three. We'll have to wait and see. Part two should be coming relatively shortly. I don't think it's gonna take me that much longer to uh, finish it by the time I upload this video. So, you know, if you guys are worried about that, don't be. I'm not gonna take a year to do it, unlike some of my other videos and other series. Don't worry, also, Wasted Potential is coming soon, and the Infernicus redesign is gonna take a while, because college is a bitch. So, yeah. Anyways, like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Stay safe, guys.